it's kind of like, you know, you back out of the driveway and you say, what's wrong with this car? It's barely going, you know, it's moving, but not the emergency brake. And you let go of the emergency brake and then you back up easily. That people's health complaints, when they're really trying to be healthy, you have to identify what the emergency brakes are that are holding them back from getting the results they're looking for. And consistently, a component is the foods that they're eating that they don't recognize are fueling more inflammation. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Vibrant Wellness Podcast. My name is Jen Rivas, and I am here with the one and only Dr. Emmy Brown. Dr. Emmy, how are you feeling today? I feel good. The sun is out, so it is a wonderful day. Yes, it is. And what's even more wonderful is that we have the pleasure of speaking with a true pioneer in the field of functional medicine, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. Tom's been a leader in the movement towards a more holistic approach to healthcare for over 30 years, with a particular focus on the link between our immune system and chronic disease. He is a sought after speaker, author, and educator, and his popular books, The Autoimmune Fix, and his latest, You Can Fix Your Brain, are a wealth of information for both people and providers alike. But what really sets Dr. Tom apart is his genuine determination to educate and wake people up on how to take the reins of their health and live a long and high quality of life. So if you're ready to be inspired by a true health warrior, grab a cup of tea and join us for this heartwarming conversation with Dr. Tom O'Brien. Dr. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Hello, Dr. Tom. We're so excited to have you. I'm going to kick it off. Let's get started with a little personal anecdote of mine, and I hope it's not TMI. <laughs> when I was a sophomore in undergrad, finally off the dining hall's meal plan and cooking on my own, if you could even call it that, and well before I was interested in natural medicine, I was oftentimes eating pasta in my boyfriend's off-campus apartment as a cheap and easy meal, right? Jar of sauce, pasta. I remember being uncomfortably gassy and bloated and just writing it off, although I think my intuition was telling me that it was the pasta. Now, hindsight is 2020, right? I know now it was the gluten. And even though I don't have celiac disease, through my experience, it's obvious it triggers an inflammatory response in myself and so many others. And it doesn't have to be just gastrointestinal in nature. In fact, you detail an impressive list of conditions associated with wheat-related disorders in your case study, non-responsive celiac disease treated with a unique functional medical approach to include autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, malignant neoplasms, chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy, schizophrenia, connective tissue diseases, allergies, inflammatory bowel disease, and various nutritional deficiencies, and that's not even the complete list. Now we know all too well how this issue has impacted me. How about you? How and why did you become interested in all things wheat-related disorders such as celiac disease, wheat allergy, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, also known as NCGS. You know, I've had the pleasure of doing a number of interviews over the years, and that is the longest question I've ever heard. <laughs> well, a long intro. How about that? Okay. That's fine. That's fine. It was Professor Marios Hajivasalu, who is a neurologist, and he runs the tertiary neurology research center, which means patient goes to a primary physician for some neurological complaint. That physician can't fix it. So the patient comes back. He sends them to a neurologist. The neurologist does what they're going to do. It doesn't work. The patient comes back four five, six months later, still suffering. If it's a sharp neurologist, he sends them to a tertiary neurology research center. And Professor Hajibasalu runs the Sheffield Neurology, Tertiary Neurology Research Center. And he published a paper in 2001. That's how long ago it was. And so they're only dealing with the worst of the worst of cases at a tertiary neurology research center. They get the worst. Nobody can figure out what's going on. 
And Professor Hajivasalu published back then that when the cause of a patient's complaints can be identified, the number of people that have elevated antibodies to a peptide of wheat is 5%. When the cause of a patient's neurological complaints cannot be identified, the number of patients with elevated antibodies to a peptide of wheat is 57%. And they put them on a gluten-free diet, they get better. It doesn't matter if it's a myeloneuropathy. It doesn't matter if it's seizures. It doesn't matter what the symptoms are. And this was 2001. And so I read that study and it just dropped my jaw and reinforced what we'd already been talking about for 15 to 20 years, I opened my practice on Valentine's Day, 1980, and we were testing for gluten sensitivity day one because my ex and I could not get pregnant when I was an intern. And uh, uh, I tried a bunch of things and I, I didn't know much, but I tried what we knew and nothing was working. And so I called the seven most famous holistic doctors I'd ever heard of at that point. And I asked them all, what do you do for infertility? They told me what they do. And I put a protocol together and we were pregnant in six weeks. My neighbors in married housing who had been through artificial insemination and hadn't worked, they asked if I could work with them. And I said, well, you know, I don't know if it's going to harm you, but I don't think it will. Sure. They were pregnant in three months. So now we're four months pregnant or so, just happy as can be past that first period where you're hoping it's going to be okay. And we're telling our friends, you know, what's, and our neighbors just got pregnant. And I'm like, wow, I don't, not quite sure what I did, but you know, I think I helped. And um, our friends would send their sister from Wisconsin. I was in school in Chicago. She would drive down cause she'd had three miscarriages and nothing was working for them. And I started working with patients out of my dormitory room before I'm in clinic. You know, you're not supposed to do that, but I was, and, uh, uh, there was not much in medicine. There's still not much in medicine. That's all or every, but this was every, every couple that had some type of fertility concerns, whether it was premature ejaculations or recurrent miscarriages or infertility or failure to implant, uh, whatever it was, every single couple had as a contributing factor to their, their symptom pattern, they were eating foods that they didn't know were a problem for them because they felt fine when they ate the food. But when we checked and we'd find uh, wheat or dairy or um, uh, 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 grains in general or Coca-Cola, you know, whatever it was, when we got the foods out of their diet and their inflammation calmed down, their body started to change. And so that was in every single fertility associated patient that we saw. And that's been the same ever since, uh, that, uh, always people that have what I call emergency breaks, meaning they're doing everything right that they know to do, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, you back out of the driveway and you say, What's wrong with this car? It's barely going. You know, it's moving, but not the emergency brake. And you let go of the emergency brake, and then you back up easily. That people's health complaints, when they're really trying to be healthy, you have to identify what the emergency brakes are that are holding them back from getting the results they're looking for. And consistently, a component is the foods that they're eating that they don't recognize are fueling more inflammation because they don't get gut symptoms. And so they feel fine when they eat the food. Well, just read the science. With celiac, the ratio is one to eight. For every one person that has gut symptoms with celiac, there are eight that don't. They've got brain symptoms or fertility symptoms or skin symptoms, but they don't have gut symptoms. So they think they're fine when they eat wheat. That's why it's so crucial. The rule of thumb for me is test, don't guess. And now we have the best tests in the world available. And I lecture all over the world. Uh, I've not been to the far East in a number of years, so I can't speak to what they offer there, but everywhere else, South America, Latin America, 
Europe. Um, at the breaks, I always go down to the vendors and see who's got what. And no one in the world has anything similar to silicon chip technology. That's why I'm here today and happy to do this for you, because these tests are second to none. They're the best in the world. Well, I know we thank you for saying that. <laughs> but I want to I want to circle back a little bit to sort of the broad um, topic of autoimmune disease, Dr. Tom, for a minute. And I just actually want to commend you. You did such a beautiful job in your books of you know, describing in these vivid metaphors what, you know, your your autoimmune system is and how um, autoimmune diseases kind of come to um, progress in the body. Now, we've seen, however, with the rise of autoimmune disease, we're not winning necessarily in that battle. What would you share with fellow providers about the importance of fully understanding the immune system in this battle against chronic disease? It's a basic 101 concept that we didn't get in our education. And that is, well, here's the evidence. The Center for Disease Control says 14 of the 15 top causes of death in the world today are chronic inflammatory diseases. Everything except unintentional injuries is a chronic inflammatory disease. Well, what does that mean? It means if your immune system's activated, creating inflammation. So the key is, why is your immune system activated? That's a basic 101 whenever you're dealing with a chronic inflammatory disease is why is this immune system activated? Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, a navy, an air force, a marines, a coast guard. We call them IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM. Different branch of cytokines are different branches of the immune system there to protect you. So when it gets activated, excessively activated, we call that inflammation. And then when you have inflammation, the million dollar question that has to be a basic 101 for every practitioner is, what is the immune system trying to protect you from? Not, let's shut down that immune system. Let's just get rid of the inflammation. Let's give steroids. And sometimes, you know, Medication is needed for short term so the patient can function, but it's not a, a steroid insufficiency that's caused the immune system to get activated. What is it trying to protect you from? That's the million dollar question. And the basis, quite honestly, of functional medicine is always looking to see why is your body functioning the way that it is? That's I, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I uh, my oldest daughter for over ten years ago was diagnosed with two autoimmune diseases, celiac and type one diabetes. Um, and I know you're probably going to open my my eyes to some hard truths on this conversation, but can you explain a little bit further the link between celiac, non celiac, uh, gluten sensitivity, and our immune system? What's going on there, Professor Hajivasalu, who I referred to earlier? Um, said it the best. The idea that you have to have gut symptoms with a immune reaction to wheat is a historical misconception. Isn't that a nice way of saying you've got your head in dark places? <laughs> Meaning that, you know, if you don't have gut symptoms, you don't have a problem with wheat or if you don't have celiac, you don't have a problem with wheat. What mm -hmm. utter nonsense. But that's the way we were trained. That's what our textbooks taught us. And so, and we've held on to that premise that if you don't have celiac, you don't have a problem with wheat. Now, in Italy, the government has designated 36 centers. Uh, it might be more now. I haven't checked in a few years, but 36 centers as gluten-related disorder centers. There's about 25 that are gastroenterology, a couple pediatric, a couple psychiatry centers. But if you get a diagnosis from one of those 36 centers of a wheat-related disorder, your food's a tax deduction. And so general practitioners and specialists, if they suspect a wheat problem for a patient, they sent them to one of these centers to get the diagnosis because you're looking, then the patient has support, an entire support system. So 
The 36 gluten-related disorder centers looked at over 15,000 people who had been referred to them. So these are patients who the local practitioner suspected they may have a problem with wheat. What did they find? They found that 7% of the patients who were referred to them were celiacs. 93% had wheat-related disorders, out non-celiac wheat-related disorders. That's the ratio. So if you're looking for evidence of celiac before you will consider a sensitivity to wheat, you'll catch less than one out of 10. Mm. You know, just read the science. And, you, and you, well, well, wait a minute. Well, you know, you, you know it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. It's like when I give presentations, I'm like this on stage. I, I just throw the studies up there. And at first you see people are like this because I'm a little aggressive. You know, I'm not really... Well, the science tells us that 7% of those related will have celiac and 93% will have a wheat-related disorder. I mean, it's not my style. I'm half Italian, right? <laughs> but you see they're like this. And then within about five minutes, they're like this. And then their pen is flying because it's, we just don't know this. You know, I'm the geek that reads the studies. I've read so many studies in the last 40 years on this topic. It's irrefutable. And we have a whole certification program online for practitioners. And I tell them, you know, once you've gone through this course, you can go toe to toe with any gastroenterologist in the world and you know what you know. Now, they know so much more about other areas of the GI system, but you know this because here's the science. Here's this study and this study and this study and this study. So these basic concepts are really important that first... One out of eight with a wheat-related disorder will have gut symptoms. The rest will not. They'll have brain, joint, skin, kidney, liver, anything other than the brain, uh, other than the gut. Second, 7% of those suspected of a wheat-related disorder will uh, pass for celiac disease. They'll pass the test for celiac. 93% will not. But you put them on a gluten-free diet, they get better. Their inflammation calms down. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I say to patients on this, Mrs. Patient, if you pull at a chain, it always breaks at your weakest link. Always. It could be at one end, the middle, the other end. It can be your heart, your brain, your gut, your liver, your reproductive system. Wherever the weak link is, you pull too hard and that's where the chain's going to break. Well, the pull on the chain is inflammation. And for many people, wheat is a primary trigger to that inflammation. So you're pulling on the chain. So where are the symptoms going to manifest? Wherever your weak link is. And how are weak links determined? There's two things that determine weak links, genetics and antecedents. What does that mean? Well, it means how you live your life. You know, for example, if you... Um, uh, uh, eat tuna, tuna fish, two, three times a week, you likely have mercury toxicity because almost all the tuna has mercury now. So that's an antecedent, lifestyle. So it's lifestyle and genetics that determine where the weak link is. So two things have to happen. The most important is stop pulling so hard on the chain, which means reduce the inflammation which means identifying where the inflammation is coming from, right? So that you can reduce the gasoline on the fire. That's a basic, basic concept. I love all these analogies. I think that's really helpful, Dr. Tom. Um, I'm going to be long-winded again, just very momentarily, <laughs> uh, because I think this is a really staggering statistic. Again, from your paper, um, you mentioned 46% of those diagnosed with a wheat-related disorder and not necessarily celiac disease with no current indicators of an autoimmune disease demonstrate elevated ANA antibodies. Right. And then in three years, 87% of that group will receive a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease. That's it's right. just shocking. That's right. Um, so a ANA antibodies are so critically important because they're the heartbringer of autoimmune disease. They're the earliest indicator that I know of. You got a problem. Well, what kind of problem? Well, we don't know yet, but just wait a couple of years. We'll find out. 
It might be Hashimoto's, it might be lupus, it might be systemic sclerosis or rheumatoid. Usually it's more musculoskeletal, but not always with A and A antibody. So what's the value? And I'm writing a paper right now on this. What's the value of looking at A and A antibody levels? Well, ANA stands for anti-nuclear antibodies. Okay. So my immune system has elevated levels of antibodies to the nucleus of my cells. What cells? Any cell, every cell, just in general, the nucleus of your cells could be your brain cells, could be your joint, could be collagen, doesn't matter. Well, why? Well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Why is the immune system attacking the deep nuclei inside the cell? Why is your immune system doing that? Because that's where the toxins go. That's where mercury goes, is into the nucleus of the cell. That's where some of these organophosphates go, is into the nucleus of the cell. So the more of this junk that you're exposed to that gets absorbed, not detoxed, broken down, and eliminated, but it gets absorbed in the body, the more likely you're going to cross the threshold where your immune system says, that's enough. Can't do that anymore. I need to fight that nucleus of the cell. I need to go after that. That's a foreign substance I have to attack. That's a neo-epitope almost. You know, neo-epitope are, are larger molecules, but the concept is that's a foreign, foreign substance that's not part of cell. I better get rid of that. So your ANA antibodies go up. And it's very, very common that in wheat-related disorders that that is a, uh, um, a sign that you find is elevated ANA antibodies. You know, it'd be lovely when people order the wheat zoomer, which is the most comprehensive test I know of, if they also had a marker on there looking at ANA antibodies, because so many doctors would then understand, whoa, now ANA antibodies are the harbinger of autoimmune disease. Which autoimmune disease? It depends on your genetics and antecedents, but it's the harbinger. 87% of people with elevated ANA antibodies within three years have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. You're absolutely right, Dr. Emmy. You're absolutely right on that. So you see that, and that's going to be a motivator to tell the patient, Mrs. Patient, we don't know what it is yet, but we do know that your immune system is attacking your own tissue. And the way that we can calm that down, and the language by the researchers is arrest arrest the development of autoimmune diseases and perhaps reverse it if we're, if we're good at this, if we're lucky. Luck has nothing to do with it. If we're comprehensive at this, but to arrest the progression of this is to identify where is the inflammation coming from. And when you have this kind of a basic 101 question, well, what's that going to do for my being unable to sleep at night, I'm not sure, but we'll find out. Well, what's that going to do with my daughter's attention deficit? I'm not sure, but we're going to find out because many studies show that when you reduce inflammation, att attention deficit goes down. When you reduce the source of inflammation, like gluten or dairy or food colorings, whatever it should be. So it, it, this understanding from practitioners allows you to have conversations with the patient where they become a willing participant of the exploratory process to figure out where, how am I throwing gasoline on the fire in my body? So the problem is not you have gasoline on the fire, you have excess inflammation. Patients don't know what that means or what to do with that. Mrs. Patient, you have excess inflammation which means that your immune system is turned on right now trying to protect you from something. And then if you pause, they go, from what? You say, well, that's what we have to find out. And then you start the exploration. Right. And that begs the question, when we do that exploration, Dr. Tom, I want to know, is there a diagnostic test for NCGS? If not, how can practitioners use laboratory testing to assess for NCGS? And also, of course, assess them clinically and from a historical standpoint to make that diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Yes, of course. Um, the most comprehensive test in the world is the wheat zoomer. 
And I can say that because I don't work for you guys. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so grateful that these tests are available. Uh, um, it's, it's changed the dynamics um, of, of how we practice. Now, patient, and it just requires the clinician to have a big picture of what they're looking at here. Because it's overwhelming, you know, when there's 26 different markers of wheat-related disorders on that test. Um, it's overwhelming for clinicians. I mean, what's the difference between a gluteomorphin antibody being elevated and an omega glidins? Well, there's substantial difference, but it's, it's like academic at this point. The problem is your body's fighting wheat. And, right. and so that's the big picture. Your body's fighting wheat. Well, is there any kind of wheat I can have? No. Can I have ancient weeds? No. Because the protein structure of the ancient weeds, once your immune system is activated, making elevated antibodies to peptides of wheat, you produce memory B cells. For those that aren't quite familiar with memory B cells, when you get a childhood vaccination for MMR, uh, let's say the measles vaccination, you get a shot of the bug measles. And your brain says, whoa, what's that in the bloodstream? You general, and you have Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. You now are General Measles. Take care of this. General Measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers trained to go after measles. They're special forces. We call them antibodies. They don't go after anything else. They're just looking for measles, and they're looking for the protein structure of measles. They get out in the bloodstream, and they're looking everywhere. Your bloodstream is just a highway. You miss know, Mrs. patient, bloodstream's just a highway. Everything's going in the same direction, but there's no lanes of traffic. Everything's bouncing into each other as it's going around. You know, give them some visuals. You know, that really helps. That really helps. And um, hang on a minute. I forgot to turn off my phone, so let me just turn this thing off. Because that's the third call that's come in. All right. No so sorry for the interruption. No so give them visuals. Then they, they're like with you. And they don't scare them with big words, you know, but just give them the visuals. So General Measles builds this assembly line. It takes a couple of months. But in a couple of months after a vaccination, you now have memory B cells to uh, measles in this example. Memory B cells are called... Uh, uh, let me say that again. The memory B cells to measles are general measles. And general measles is just hanging out there, always looking around. And when general measles sees that all of the measles bug from the initial vaccination, they're gone, he says, okay, turn off the assembly line. We don't need any more soldiers right now. But general measles is vigilant the rest of his life. So you're sitting on an airplane 10 years later, and the guy behind you from Mozambique is coughing into the air, and you inhale some measles. Well, now it's in your bloodstream, gets in the lungs into the bloodstream. General measles, who's vigilant, always, oh, and he just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line again. He just has to turn the switch on. And within a day to two days, you got measles antibodies. So the small exposure you had doesn't have a chance to take off and reproduce. That's what memory B cells do. When you have elevated antibodies to any peptide of wheat, you develop memory B cells to those peptides of wheat. You don't develop memory B cells to eggs or to soy. And I've asked three immunologists that say, hey, am I correct in this that there are no such thing as memory B cells to fruit or cantaloupe or anything like that, that you might outgrow an allergy and they've just kind of look at me and say, well, you know, never thought about that, but yeah, that's, I guess that's true. But just Google memory B cells and gluten. Here come the studies. It's the only food that this occurs for. Why does this occur? Because every single human that's exposed to gluten activates toll-like receptor four in the proximal part of the small intestine. Every human, every exposure. Maureen Leonard at Harvard, famous gastroenterologist, did a literature review 
I think it was 60 some studies. I don't quite remember the number. And she published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in JAMA. And her conclusion, this activation of transient intestinal permeability by activating toll-like receptor 4 occurs in all humans who consume gluten. Mm. This, now, this is where the audience usually goes like this. Because <laughs> they don't like it. Yeah. That means you and the bagel you had this morning. You just need it more leaky gut. Now, it's transient intestinal permeability with every activation. Transient intestinal permeability until you've altered the microbiome so much, you now have an inflammatory microbiome, and now it's permanent intestinal permeability for the environment that's in there. All humans. And this occurs every time we're exposed to wheat. Every time. Now, so you've got these memory B cells. Why? Because toll-like receptor 4 is in the proximal part of the small intestine. What's toll-like receptor 4? I like to think of it as a sentry. These guys are sentries standing guard. And I think of the soldiers at Buckingham Palace with those big hats that are as stiff as can be. They're just dormant. They're just standing there. They don't move. But don't mess with those guys. Don't mess with them. Toll-like receptor 4 is supposed to be dormant. But what's its job? Its job is to identify microorganisms. Well, why? Because it's, it, it was a life-saving mechanism for our ancestors. Our ancestors, before 10,000 years ago, foraged for food. They, followed, they were nomads. They followed the herds. So the first priority was always to find food. Second, shelter. Three, safety for reproduction, but number one was food. So they find something. First, they sniff it. Then they nibble at it. Then they eat it. Well, if there was a pathogen in that food that they couldn't identify, hydrochloric acid in the stomach is supposed to kill it. But if it doesn't, the backup system is toll-like receptor 4 in the proximal part of the small intestine. It's standing guard and it's screening everything that comes into the small intestine from the stomach. And if it sees a pathogen, it does two things. First, it activates increased zonulin production, which is the protein that causes leaky gut. Second, it increases NF-kappa B, which is the major amplifier of inflammation in the gut. So why does it increase zonulin? Because when you increase zonulin, the tight junctions open up between the cells and water comes into the lumen of the intestine to wash out the bug with the poop. Think of mud that's stuck on your driveway. You turn on the garden hose to try and wash it off. It doesn't work. You have to put your thumb over the opening of the garden hose to create a spray that washes off the mud caked down the driveway. That's what toll-like receptor 4 does. It activates zonulin to wash out the bug that it's identified. It's a life-saving mechanism. Those of our ancestors that did not have this mechanism, they died. They didn't reproduce. Those that had this life-saving immune mechanism, they lived, they reproduced, and they passed on the lineage generation after generation. We still have that today. Toll-like receptor 4, the proximal part of the small intestine, is scanning all the food that comes through. And it's Alessio Fasano at Harvard who showed us back in 1997, they published the first studies on leaky gut. They've been publishing now for over 20 years on this, 25 years. And he showed us that gluten is misinterpreted as a harmful component of a microorganism. Toll-like receptor 4 sees the amino acid structure of these peptides of wheat that look just like the amino acid structure of pot uh, potentially harmful microorganisms. And you make memory B cells to this. So when you eat ancient wheat, the amino acid structure of the poorly digested proteins of ancient wheat look exactly like the amino acid structures of the current wheat. So you still activate the immune response. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just read the science on this. And there's so many studies on ancient wheats now being as immunogenic and sometimes more immunogenic wow. 
than modern wheat. Not like you don't have enough on your plate, Dr. Tom, but if you ever wanted to write a kid's book on autoimmunity, you <laughs> would just kill it because you do such an incredible job of explaining it in a way that people can, no pun intended, digest it and understand right. it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, and we, well, uh, for, for all of our listeners, please excuse my intensity, but wake up. Just read the science. Just read the science on this. It's irrefutable. And you may not like it because you like your pizza. I feel fine when I eat pizza. Really? Really? Do the wheat zoomer and then tell me that again. With 97 to 99% sensitivity and 98 to 100% specificity for a wheat-related disorder. Do that test and then tell me that there's no problem here. When you see how many of the peptides of wheat you have elevated antibodies to, that are fueling the inflammation that's going to produce wherever the weak link in your chain is one of the 14 of the 15 top causes of death. Right? It's like, wake up. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to circle back to the case studies. I know Dr. Emmy's got some more questions about that, but I just quickly wanted to touch on Dr. Tom, you mentioned um, digestive enzyme support in gluten-free diets. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you use it in your practice? Oh, thank you. Critically, critically important concept, critically important. So once we recognize that people have to avoid wheat, uh, you can't do low gluten diets. You can't do cheat days. Show me the science on a cheat day, right? You can't do that. <laughs> uh, we want to be nice with our patients. Don't be nice. Be kind. Nice is, I don't want to cause any waves. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to upset them. Kind is authenticity with compassion, right? You have to be authentic with them. You have to tell them the truth, right? And once you get a positive wheat zoomer back, now you may have to transition them, especially those that have elevated antibodies to gluteomorphins or prodynorphins, the opiates of wheat. Those people have a harder time giving up wheat. They're addicted to it. It's the opiates. And so, Mrs. Patient, let's start you off with three. I'm, I'm going to have you see Kathy, our health coach, who's going to work with you on transitioning your lifestyle. And let's start with three mornings a week of gluten-free breakfast. And when you've got that down and you go to four mornings a week because you're feeling comfortable now with your option, let's include one or two lunches a week of gluten-free. I'd rather you take your time. It's going to take you a month or two to transition to gluten-free because if you just go cold turkey, chances are pretty good you're going to have a rough time and you might get a little emotional, you know, uh, the opiate withdrawal kind of symptoms. So let's just take it easy. So there can be a transition where you give patients permission to continue. But bottom line, uh, and how much, how much of these peptides of wheat does it take to activate uh, toll-like receptor four, Detlef Schupan, very famous gastroenterologist at Harvard, published in 2014. So we've known this now for nine years. The amylase trypsin inhibitors in wheat. Now, if you have amylase trypsin inhibitors elevated, antibodies to amylase trypsin inhibitors, you really have a sensitivity. You need to be so focus on reducing all exposures because amylase trypsin inhibitors, it takes a nanogram to activate toll-like receptor four. Most people don't know what a nanogram is. It's a billionth of a gram, wow. a billionth of a gram. I have a hard time fathoming what that would look like because you can't see it. Right. Just the tiniest little amount. That's why toasters, you can't use a toaster where the toast from regular bread has been made in that toaster because it just takes a nanogram of ATIs, amylase trypsin inhibitors, to activate the entire inflammatory cascade. Now, what happens when you activate the entire inflammatory cascade? So you've turned on the memory B cells. They turn on the assembly line. Here come the antibodies to that peptide of wheat. How long does that last for? Well, we know, we know, depending on which memory B cells you're looking at, 
it's somewhere between four and 10 weeks of activation producing the antibodies from a single exposure. So the, the, the machinery producing the antibodies goes four weeks, six weeks, somewhere around there. But the lifespan of the antibody that's produced at the end of the, the assembly line being turned on, the lifespan of those later produced antibodies is four to six weeks. So you're looking eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks of inflammation from a single exposure. Now, what does that inflammation mean? It means if you have Hashimoto's thyroid and you're successful in putting in remission, but now you have a bite of somebody's pizza because, well, I, I won't feel bad if I just have a bite. You can have at TPO antibodies for 10 weeks, elevated TPO antibodies. That's what it means. And it's like, whoa, yeah. whoa. That's why you have to be so close. So the question was about enzymes. One more point before we get to the enzymes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just love this work, you know, and, and I, that's my entire certified gluten-free practitioner course is like this. Boom, 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 nonstop because it's so important, so important that we know this. So, um, the enzymes, what about the enzymes? At Columbia Celiac Research Center, Peter Green and Ben Liebwall and their team, world-renowned gastroenterologists, um, they gave 804 people testing equipment, trained them how to use it, and asked them to go, go out in the community with this testing equipment and go to restaurants and order off of gluten-free menus. Mm -hmm. So, and here's seven cartridges. Uh, to order seven different things off of gluten-free menus. So that's 5,624 items off of gluten-free menus. And then they place the order. The waiter or waitress walks away. They open their briefcase. They put the testing equipment on the table, lay out the seven cartridges. They come back with the food. They say, whoa, what's all this? And then they might even talk to the waiter or waitress. They take the first one. They put it in the cartridge, put it in the testing equipment. Is there gluten in there? It takes about two minutes, yes or no, uh, above 20 parts per million. Take the cartridge out, disperse it, uh, or get rid of it. Take the next cartridge, put it in the next food. They did seven foods, 5,624 foods. 32% of everything on a gluten-free menu is not gluten-free. 32%. And this testing equipment has 97% reproducibility. It's right on the money. 32% of everything. 53% of gluten-free pasta is not gluten-free. 51% of gluten-free pizza is not gluten-free. Do you get the message? You can't go out and eat ever when you have a sensitivity to wheat without being exposed. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. So what do you do? How, I mean, I've wrestled with this for years. And you know, people were coming out with these gluten-digesting enzymes. Uh, and, uh, I read the science. I said, well, that doesn't work because these enzymes only work in an alkaline environment, which means they're going to work to protect the large intestine after the bolus of food has been traveling through the stomach, through the small intestine into the large intestine. But wait a minute, where are the toll-like receptors? They get activated, creating the systemic inflammation in the proximal part of the small intestine. And these enzymes don't work in the proximal part of the small intestine because that's an acidic environment. So I worked for years to come up with digestive enzymes that work in the stomach. And it's 99% complete degradation of inadvertent exposure to the top eight allergens, which is wheat, dairy, soy, egg, fish, shellfish, peanuts, and whatever the other one is I'm not remembering. But 99% within 60 minutes before the food comes out of the stomach into the proximal part of the small intestine. So we tell all our patients, Mrs. Patient, anytime you go out to eat, here's what you're up against. That the food, I mean, you know, the chef is trying his best, but the oatmeal he's using is not, it's contaminated. Or the corn pasta he's using is contaminated. Or the chef's kind of sloppy and he's using the same wooden spoon to stir regular pasta 
and stir your pasta. Who knows where it's coming from? But this, these are the numbers. 32% of everything on a gluten-free menu is not gluten. Just read the science. And this is in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. And Peter Green and Ben Liebwald. It's like, what? What? So when you take these enzymes, usually, Mrs. Patient, when you take digestive enzymes, and most of us can benefit from taking digestive enzymes, usually you take them in the middle of a meal so that in your stomach, they're sitting in the center of that glob of food and they digest from the inside going out. And your enzymes will digest from the outside coming in. So you get much more efficient utilization of all this, but not with these enzymes. With these, you take them before you start eating so that nothing comes out of the stomach into the proximal part of the small intestine that could activate toll-like receptors. And if I'm doing gluten-free pasta, I'll take some, at, of course, at the beginning, but then I'll take some in the middle of the meal also. So you have to be careful about gluten enzymes. You have to get the right ones. And the ones that uh, we recommend are Wheat Rescue and E3 Advanced Plus. The difference, Wheat Rescue has more digestive enzyme in it, like hydrochloric acid. It's the 40-40 rule. By the age of 40, most of us are only making 40% of the hydrochloric acid we used to. Uh, there's a wonderful book to read by Dr. Jonathan Wright called Why Hydrochloric Acid is good for you. It's on Amazon. It's a little paperback book. It, you, when you read that, you will understand why you want to supplement most of your patients. Uh, 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 so Wheat Rescue has a little more hydrochloric acid, a little more digestive enzyme in it. E3 Advanced Plus has bacteriophages. Now, bacteriophages are um, good viruses that go after pathogenic bacteria. So if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or the way we say to Mrs. Patient, Given that you've got gut symptoms when you're exposed to wheat, you take the E3 because it's going to help to clean up your gut a little bit more. But those are the two enzymes that we know. 99% full degradation of any inadvertent exposures. And those that ask, well, can I just take extra enzymes and eat regular pizza? I look at them and I say, really? Really? Well, you know, if you want to do it, or it's the same question about people saying, I want to go to Europe because I can eat the wheat in Italy and I don't have problems when I eat the wheat in Italy. Well, doc, you know, I, I can eat the wheat in Italy. No, you can't. But I don't feel bad when I eat the wheat in Italy. That's because you're one, you're the one of the eight. You get gut symptoms when you're exposed to wheat. And when you go to Italy, you don't get any gut symptoms. So you think you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's the FODMAPs in wheat that create the gut problems, the gut symptoms. And it's the proteins in wheat that activate the immune system. And the wheat in Italy is lower in FODMAPs. So you can eat the wheat in Italy and not have gut symptoms and think you're fine. But when you come back home and we run another test on you, your immune system's going through the roof because it's the proteins that toll-like receptor four is responding to, not the FODMAPs. And, but Mrs. Patient, if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. Let's just do another test now. We've already cleared up your problem. We did the repeat a couple months ago. The wheat zoomer's normal. Way to go. You're doing great. Everything's working. Let's do a test now just to confirm it's still that way. Then go to Italy and have a blast. Just enjoy yourself. Then come on back and we'll do another test. And we'll see if general gluten got activated and the assembly line's producing the soldiers again and your autoimmune mechanisms are back. And sometimes that's what you have to do with a patient. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate they have to do that because they're going to cause more damage. But for the rest of their life, they now will know and they will understand. Oh, okay. Okay, darn. <laughs> well, you definitely hit the nail on the head because you're talking about retesting. It's not a one and done deal with most patients. Why? Tell us why you feel retesting is so underutilized and what providers could be missing or leaving on the table, so to speak, when it comes to their patient's long-term health. Yeah. Yeah. It's because you're being nice instead of kind. Um, the goal here, if the big picture goal is quality of life in your senior years, if that's the big picture goal to have an enhanced quality of life, the only way you can do that 
unless you're just going to live on stimulants for a shorter period of time. The only way to do that is to reduce the chronic systemic inflammation that is killing off tissue, killing off tissue, killing off tissue, and you don't feel when it's going on. So you have to reduce the chronic systemic inflammation. Well, my patient's symptoms are all gone. Their knees are working great now. And are you willing to wager on your patient's life that you've calmed down the immune response? You know, you ask the right question, and they go, well, well, uh, well, well, um, because you're really gambling with the, their life, their quality of life in their senior years when you allow them to just say, you know, they come back for a checkup visit. They're feeling great. You say, well, let's do that blood. Oh, doc, I don't want to spend the money. I feel good. And he said, well, then you're, you're going to be nice. The best you can do is explain to them many, many times this lower grade inflammation is still going on because there's something in your house or there's a cross reactivity with another food. And I'm glad your symptoms are gone. I'm really glad your migraines are gone or whatever the symptoms are. But we have to confirm that your army or your air force has calmed down and they're back on standby. They're not on high alert. If they're on high alert, you're going to be killing off brain cells or killing off collagen or killing off skin cells, whatever it should be. And so we have to embrace this for ourselves as clinicians. And then it's really easy. No, 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 Mr. Patient. I used to have dot, dot, dot symptoms, whatever they are. And I did the test. I was shocked to see it was wheat. We've gone completely gluten-free. All my symptoms are gone. And um, so I said, great. Well, I don't need to retest them. I, I feel great. I feel great. A year and a half later, something else hit me. And I, I did the test again. And they were through the roof. It was through the roof. And I was still gluten-free. But I never tested to confirm I had done the job completely. That's why you have to help the patient get to ground zero. You know, I was just talking with my friend yesterday, Professor Rodney Ford from New Zealand. He is a, a pediatric allergist, gastroenterologist, board certified gastroenterologist. And Rodney was the pioneer back in the 1990s who was talking about zero gluten. And he wrote a book on it, zero gluten, not low gluten, not uh, minor amount, just zero. And I just commended him again yesterday for being such a pioneer. In, in talking about this. So zero gluten, zero impact. We have to have a calm down immune system. And that won't happen if your immune system is still trying to protect you from what it considers a threat. What about other labs, Dr. Tom? So you touched on heavy metals. You touched on the microbiome. What else do you routinely order? You also mentioned an ANA as part of the wheat tumor. I will maybe suggest that to the higher ups. I think that that's a very reasonable um, and helpful request there. What else do you routinely order for your patients? Yeah, it actually leads to more tests being done. You know, you have to talk to the lab president like the president of a lab. It's a business right? They're all businesses. And for everyone out there, ask your sales rep uh, for whatever labs you're using, what's the sensitivity and specificity? And they don't know. They don't know. They say, well, call your lab director and find out, would you? And they'll get some gobbledygook and they won't tell you. They won't tell you, but Vibrant will tell you. They'll give you the papers published by Mayo Clinic on the sensitivity and specificity. Joe Murray at Mayo, world-famous gastroenterologist, calls it a new era in laboratory medicine using silicone chip technology because uh, uh, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. So uh, what other, So the, the idea of doing ANA testing with the wheat zoomer, it's because that's an introductory test. But if ANA comes back elevated, now you need to do other tests. What autoimmune mechanisms are going on for this person? And they're not diagnosed yet, but what's going on? But what other tests do we do? Um, we, depending on their lifestyle and how they present to us, uh, we'll usually do Zoomer bundles. And the lab has been so great to package bundles. 
you know, four tests you get for this price, eight tests you get much cheaper and all that. I mean, there's no one that compares in pricing. It's really great what they've done. But um, I wanted, uh, the things that I want to look at are the triggers of inflammation in the introductory tests that we're doing with the patient. First, everyone gets the wheat zoomer and the neural zoomer plus. I don't care what their symptoms are. They get those two tests minimum. Why? Because Blue Cross Blue Shield came out in March of 2020 with a review and they said, we got a problem here. That in the previous four years, in a four-year period, there was a 407% increase in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's in 30 to 44-year-olds. Wow. 407% increase in four years. It's like, what? Nobody knows this, but there's an epidemic. There's a pandemic that nobody's talking about, and it's the amount of inflammation that's going on in our bodies now because of all the toxic exposures we are born with, everybody's heard, every newborn child, when you check the placental blood, there's over 200 chemicals in that blood that not supposed to be there in every newborn child that they check and, you know, throughout lives. And why are young people getting sick earlier? Because their parents have accumulated all of these toxins much, much more in their lifespan than my generation did. So for my children who are in their 40s now, had, or the generation before, every generation is accumulating more toxins and more toxins and more toxins and passing on the altered microbiomes and the amount of toxins that baby is developing with in utero. Here's a great study. Chicago, 2016, 346 pregnant women in the eighth month of pregnancy. And they collected urine and checked them for five phthalates, just five. There are many others, but they just checked five. And they put them into quartiles, the lowest, the next, the third, and the highest quartile. They followed the offspring of those pregnancies for seven years. When the children turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them, the official IQ test. What did they find? You know, there's not much in medicine that's all or every. This was every, every child whose mother was in the highest quartile of phthalates and urine in pregnancy compared to the children whose mothers were in the lowest quartile Every child in the highest quartile, their IQ was seven points lower. 6.7 to 7.4 points lower. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. Until you understand a one-point difference in IQ is noticeable, a seven-point difference in IQ is the difference between a child working really hard, getting straight A's, and a child working really hard, really working hard, getting straight C's. This child doesn't have a chance in hell of ever excelling. Then just go to Google and type in phthalates and neurogenesis. Here come the studies. The higher the level of phthalates, the lower the neurogenesis. And that's what we're up against. Every generation has more toxic accumulation than the generation before. That's what we're up against. So I want to know, what are the environmental exposures that your immune system is trying to protect you from? Critically important. That's why you do the ANA with the wheat zoomer, because the wheat zoomer also is the most comprehensive test for intestinal permeability that I've ever seen. You throw ANA in there with it, and that's the cue for the clinician, Mrs. Patient, we need to follow up and see what autoimmune mechanisms may be going on for you right now, because this marker is the harbinger of autoimmunity. And there are many papers that tell us that. We just don't know, is it your thyroid or your brain? Is it your joints or your skin? Is it your gut? We just don't know where it is. So we need to do um, a few more tests to find out what is your immune system currently fighting. Right. And that helps the providers put together the pieces. You've mentioned several different tests. Thank you for speaking to those. Um, and that leads me to a two-part question. I'm wondering, you mentioned a training program earlier. Where can providers begin to learn about root cause of autoimmune disease and how to manage it holistically? Because that's a lot of information, a lot of great information, um, albeit lots of detail. So where can providers really start to learn about how to manage these complex cases? And then also, do you find value in a combined approach working collaboratively with a rheumatologist 
um, if we are doing this functional work. Um, I imagine maybe after getting some training, maybe we won't need to consult so often with a rheumatologist, maybe depending on the case, but I'd love to know kind of your experience. Yeah, thank Just, you for that. Yeah. Yeah, the website is certifiedglutenpractitioner.com. Uh, and you'll, you'll see it there. It's pretty obvious. And I, I was right there and I'm telling everybody, you know what, if you're not happy, just tell us, we'll give you a refund. No problem. We've never had anyone. We have thousands of people that have gone through now and the docs, you know, the testimonials are always so, I had no idea. So, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, I, I don't think practitioners have the time to counsel patients on all of what they need to learn. I think it's critically important that practitioners build an alliance or bring someone on your team, a registered dietitian, a nutritionist, a health coach, one of your staff that's got the training, whatever, but someone who can sit with the patient on a number of visits and walk with them in down this path of changing their lifestyle. You can't do it on your own. You can't. And in terms of um, uh, uh, collaborating with um, specialists like rheumatologists or cardiologists, yeah, if you find someone who's open, and there are many now that are, and the way you can find out uh, one way is go to uh, IFM's, the Institute for Functional Medicine's website, and look for cert certified practitioners and look for rheumatologists or cardiologists or psychiatrists that have been certified in functional medicine. They're very open. And you work, you know, that, and we've done this many times. I have cardiologists and we'll see a patient that turns out that they've got uh, antibodies to their cardiovascular system, right? Or they've got elevated TMAOs and we'll send them to a cardiologist, a functional medicine, a functional cardiologist who uh, will take lead on that aspect of their care. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, it's just finding the right people to refer to. But in that line of discussion, critically important you have someone on your team or that you have an alliance with that can walk with this patient down the road and that they get joy in doing that. Most doctors yeah. don't have time. You know, it's, well, you know, I ate this thing and it turned out that it, there was gluten. And I said, yeah, I know I've had the same experience, but that's not going to help the patient so much, you know? <laughs> so you want someone on your team or that you can refer the patient to. If you refer out, you make the agreement with that patient, they send you detailed notes on what they talked about with that patient. You put in their file. So next time Mrs. Smith comes in, oh, I see that you saw Kathy, our, our, our nutritional nurse uh, that we refer to. Yeah, how, oh, she was great. Oh my God, I'm learning so much. Oh, that's marvelous. And she was talking about this, this, and the, yes, yes. So you're on top of it. You don't just pass the buck. You're still on top of it. You just don't have to do all that work yourself. Right. So you're truly coordinating care, getting yes. those notes, staying on top of it. I think that's such an important reminder. Even writing letters to our referrals, introducing ourselves as providers. That's something I was always telling the residents I was working with. Um, so good reminder there. Yeah. Well, I know we're getting ready to wrap up, Dr. Tom, but I'd love to know what's next on the docket for you. Is there any exciting new projects or anything you're working on? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, actually, we're uh, doing interviews now on a docu-series um, oh. that will come out um, hopefully before the end of the year. I suspect it'll be before the end of the year. On uh, Where is the chronic inflammation coming from? And educating patients on embracing that they're going on a journey. You don't go to a doctor expecting a prescription. No, you may expect a prescription and then you're going to be fine, but that's not where you're going to arrest the development of autoimmune diseases. You have to understand that you're going on a journey, that lifestyle got you to where you are and you, you really didn't know or else you wouldn't be doing dot, 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 whatever it is. So we've been interviewing all over the world and lots of patient testimonials who reverse multiple sclerosis, reverse chronic fatigue, Epstein-Barr, what it took, uh, lots of tears from some of them of what they went through to finally get to where they are in remission. So that's coming. That's coming later in the year. Oh, I'll be excited for that. That sounds awesome. I love documentaries. I mean, 
Right. I love how you're setting realistic expectations too with the journey concept. That's right. That's so important. You know, that's where, that's, that's where I think, uh, uh, vibrance offerings really come in and, you know, I didn't prep for this for vibrant, you know, uh, uh, but, uh, their tests are so accurate and so comprehensive that it allows you to bring the patient into this world of a journey. Joseph Campbell calls it the hero's journey. You're actually doing the hero's journey for your own health. And that means you've got to come up against obstacles that you never knew were there in front of you. And you, you're coming up against the, these things that you, you just never knew. And that's going to happen again and again and again so that your quality of life, you know, I'm, uh, my goal is to uh, shake it up at my son's wedding, you know, to uh, be on the dance floor, shaking it up. My son is now two years old and, uh, you know, I'm 71. So I've got a few years I have to be around, right, uh, um, to be at his wedding. That's not going to happen unless I'm doing the things now that are just maintaining this vehicle that we all have. So um, it's a different paradigm. It's, it's a different paradigm for patients and for our clinicians. Once they embrace the paradigm for themselves, they explore all this for themselves. Just read the science. It's irrefutable. Do my course. If you don't like it, we'll give you your money back, you know. But once you've seen the science on all of this, it's irrefutable. And then you start at your own pace to begin transitioning your lifestyle. Then you can look in your patient's eye and you can say, no, 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 no. I actually did this myself and I was startled when I learned dot, dot, dot. But now, oof, you know, so uh, that's my last message. Usually when I'm on stage talking about these types of things is encouraging doctors to do it themselves. Take these, uh, do, do the wheat zoomer, do the neural zoomer plus, get scared out of your mind because you've got 12 antibodies to your brain elevated right now. And you go, whoa, whoa. Well, is this accurate? Well, sure. Do it again if you want. You'll see it's accurate. Oh, that's the other thing I do. And uh, on stage is that I always challenge doctors to do double blind testing. Meaning when you draw a tube of blood from a patient, take two tubes out of the same blood draw, two tubes. One tube goes to the lab to order whatever you're ordering. The other tube, you label Joe Smith and send it to the same lab with the same test. But you'll have to pay for it yourself, doc. You can't charge the patient and you can't, you can't tell the sales rep you're doing it because they'll make sure the results are accurate, right? But when you do that, and then just look, do that five times with the lab. And if you get two or three out of five times where do I talk to the patient about the really good results or the really bad results on the same blood, you'll see it again and again. And that's what it means when you don't have 97% sensitivity and specificity, you get different results. I've done that with Vibrant three times and every time it was within two to 3%. So I accept that. That's fine. And after that, I stopped spending the money, to, you know, to check <laughs> the piece because the technology is cutting edge. And Joe Murray at Mayo says it's a new era in laboratory medicine. So do blind tests with the labs you're currently using to check for food sensitivities and then do that with Vibrant and notice the difference. Then no one can convince you otherwise because you've seen it for yourself. There you go. And you've done it. You've seen it. Yeah. And with that, we cannot thank you enough, Dr. Tom. And to wrap it up, today we touched on wheat-related disorders. They're linked to autoimmune disease and a slew of other conditions and laboratory testing to screen for and monitor these inflammatory conditions that have become all too common. Thank you again, Dr. O'Brien, Dr. Tom, for joining us today. We've learned so much. We appreciate you sharing your wisdom for our listeners. Now it's that time, if you don't mind, to uh, shake it up with us. We would <laughs> love to send you off with three rapid-fire questions, non-clinical in nature, before we let you go. How does that sound? Okay. <laughs> We're going to have some fun. So first one, 
Have you ever experimented with gluten-free baking? And if so, what is your favorite recipe for our listeners today? <laughs> I was a baker. Believe you it or were. not. <laughs> I was doubting this question. And look at this. <laughs> In my 20s, I was a baker. My hair was down to my waist and I lived in Ann Arbor and and uh, we made this uh, yeast-free, unleavened bread that would rise over 24 hours. And it was a destination bread. People drove to get it. Uh, and, but I never understood why I had such hypoglycemia. You know, because I would take a thick slice of this bread out of the oven, peanut butter on it, protein, of course, pour honey on it, and then slice bananas. Mm. And oh my God, you know, the... The glycemic index of a slice of bread is so much higher than a Snickers bar, right? And so, but I was a baker, and uh, so my my wife bakes quite a bit, and she loves it, and she's really good at it, really, really good. And, of course, everything's um, gluten-free. We use a lot of almond flour. I don't do any baking. She does it all. But I'll say this. One of the things that she's using that we are so grateful for is Himalayan tartary buckwheat that um, if any of our clinicians don't know about Himalayan tartary buckwheat, it's Dr. Jeff Bland's um, signature. He hopes this will be his swan song in life, that this last decades of his life are, are devoted to educating people on the benefits of this most powerful food on the planet. Nothing has the number of phytonutrients and antioxidants and polyphenols that Himalayan tartary buckwheat has. It's really quite remarkable. So that's the pearl that you can take away from that first yes. question. <laughs> Excellent. Very valuable. Thank you. We got two more for you, Dr. Tom. What is your favorite place that you've ever visited and why? Oh, what's the first place that comes to mind is Molokai in Hawaii, the leper island. And there's a hike at the west end, uh, no, the east end of the island, uh, and uh, you hike to a waterfall and walking along this dilapidated trail. It's not a good trail. Uh, mm -hmm. Safe as long as you have good boots. Um, but there's passion fruit growing. You just grab a passion fruit. Yeah, bite it. You know, My favorite. Spit, <laughs> spit out the, the reel, then just suck the fruit out uh, mm -hmm. and then dive into the dive into the waterfall when you're there. Wow, that sounds fabulous, actually. <laughs> I want to be transported there right now. Yes. Uh, all right, our last question for you. This has been fun. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Being more effective at talking with our clinicians on embracing these concepts. These, these are the paradigm-changing concepts in a practice completely changes how you practice as you, as you learn and apply these principles for yourself and your family. If I could be anything, I, I just want to be more effective at doing it. Thank you for, for giving us that. And just for, you know, just being here, you've inspire so many with your steadfast determination to arm both people and providers with the resources, the knowledge, the case studies, empowering them to be their own advocate for a long, beautiful life. So tell the listeners, um, Dr. Tom, where they can find you, your books, more about you, maybe your course that we talked about. Oh, thank you. Our website is thedoctor.com, thedr.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out, thedr.com. And there's lots of videos. Our books are there. The books are on Amazon. Uh, um, lots of handouts. You know, I've got so many handouts. Here's one that's really great the dr.com forward slash plant. And there you get the studies from NASA on how two six inch house plants in a 10 by 10 room absorbs over 70% of the toxins in the air. Wow. And that's the fluoromethanes and the uh, formaldehydes and all the other toxins that are produced off gassing from your bedroom furniture. If it's not solid wood, if it's press board, it's outgassing formaldehyde and varnish for years or the plastic blinds that are outgassing phthalates. So you go there and get that handout. Use it with your patients. You're welcome to. Uh, so it's the, the DR.com. 
And our course is certifiedglutenpractitioner.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Tom. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, listeners. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.